and welcome, welcome to our new location, Smoke Barbecue. How are y'all doing this evening? Just a few notes on refreshments, but I, I see that y'all have found it. But for the people who just came, we have a cash bar in the back. We have bottomless, and y'all are eating that too, sliders and Frito pies for $10. So if you haven't already partaken, it's there for you. Um, on your tables, um, while you are listening to our fabulous speaker this evening, there's this little card that if you are shy at the end and you don't want to ask a question, you can text. So the card says text T-O-T-S-A to 22333. Just locate the blue card on your table for instructions. If you have a question that comes up that you would like to ask the Archbishop and you feel shy, you can text it and I'll give it to you all so that y'all have that over there. So, this is our new chapter in Theology on Tab. We're going to be here at Smoke Barbecue from now on, so thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out and supporting us. Any first timers here? Raise your hands. All right. Awesome. We hope you all come back and bring friends. Okay, so, I'm going to introduce our speaker. The Most Reverend Gustavo Garcia Sier was named Archbishop of San Antonio by Pope Benedict XVI and installed as Archbishop on November 23, 2010 as the sixth Archbishop of San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Previously, he served as an auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of Chicago and was ordained a bishop by Francis Cardinal George in 2003. How many of you were alive back then? <laughs> <laughs> He's not old, I'm just kidding. Archbishop Gustavo, as he prefers to be called, was born on December 21st, 1956 in San Luis Potosí, Mexico, and is the eldest of 15 children. <laughs> in addition to helping care for his siblings, Archbishop Gustavo grew up sweeping floors, washing windows, and keeping things in order for the family furniture store through his teenage years. Archbishop earned a bachelor's and master's degree in theology and divinity from St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California. He also holds master's degrees in philosophy and psychology. Mm. In 1975, Archbishop <laughs> <laughs> I know you. <laughs> I, I know you too, sir. <laughs> he was professed a member of the Missionaries of the Holy Spirit and was ordained a priest in 1984 in Guadalajara, Mexico and became a U.S. citizen in 1998. His more than 30 years of priestly service has taken many forms. He has served the immigrant community and parishes in Los Angeles and Oregon, given numerous parish missions throughout the United States, and has been formator and instructor for his religious community and seminaries in Guadalajara, Mexico, Long Beach, California, and Mount Angel Seminary in Oregon. Recognized for his leadership, Archbishop Gustavo has served as Major Superior of the Missionaries of the Holy Spirit and was elected the Borders Provincial in 2003. On a national level, Archbishop Gustavo has been the Chairman of the Committee for Cultural Diversity for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and many other subcommittees. You all, please help me welcome Archbishop Gustavo. Woo! To be with you, I got the opportunity to visit a little bit with almost all of you tonight. There are a couple of you that I didn't have the opportunity to say hello. 
Uh, personally, I love to, to do that because it makes a difference, not only in, in uh, my, my understanding of who you are, but it builds up a relationship differently. Uh, we, it's the first time that we are doing intelligent talk in this place. What do you think? Yes, yeah. yeah. please. Yeah. And the food I didn't eat tonight, but many of you told me that the food is very good. Mm -hmm. So may you enjoy. And and today, I mean tonight, I was asked to speak to you about a lady who is one of the persons that I know the most in my life. And her name was uh, is Concepcion Cabrera de Armida, known as Conchita. She was the, is the foundress of my community. She started the order with a priest from France. Uh, but Conchita was born in Mexico. And I, though she died in 1937, as I will mention later, but I was able to, to get to know her and the spirituality over the years. And, um, and so, um, you know, I have been thinking, really is one of the persons that I know the most. And so it will be my parents, members of my family. Do you control that? Mm -hmm. Thank you, my parents. And, and why to share about her? Because she was beatified the last May 4th, in other words, Pope Francis named her Blessed, and is on the way to, to the canonization. But this lady, as you will find out tonight, um, though was an ordinary woman, she was remarkable, yeah, but she was able to contribute to society. So the main thing behind my sharing with you about her is the call to holiness. That is not about statues like this. <laughs> because then you cannot imitate that, and we don't want you to do that. You walk on the streets like this. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> So the way the call to holiness, and though maybe you have heard already talks about holiness, today will be the face of Conchita. On December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, in 1862, a woman was born in San Luis Potosí, Mexico. And just by the way, is what I was born to. <laughs> 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 Her name was Maria Concepcion Cabrera, but eventually she would be known simply as Conchita. Conchita was born during the conflict between France and Mexico and lived during the Mexican Revolution and the severe persecutions of the church and the faith. So she had to, to live out her faith and it was a lot of opposition. And just that you can picture a little bit of that. When I was ordained, this is in 1984, a priest, I, at that time, were, I was not able to wear a collar. If we were wearing a collar, officially, we would have received a fine in Mexico. In my school, when the inspectors from the government that were coming in, we have to switch books. The, the books, that was a Catholic school, we have to put it on one side, and to get the books, but they were all with the same kind of cover that were, uh, from the government. And all the crucifixes, and, and, and we have a, a kind of a, a way to, to do it, but every time that we heard the bell in a certain way, we knew, it was inspection. We needed to rearrange their classrooms. That was it, and it was in 1984, and she was part of the main uh, 
or the upheaval of the persecution that was between 1914 and 1937. There were many years of persecution. She knew the conflict and pain. She knew the suffering that God's people endured. But through all of this, she cultivated her love of God and his church. She found love and married Francisco Armida, called, like many Franciscas, they call Pancho. Pancho. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that in English and Spanish, you understand. Pancho. Pancho. Oh, Lord. Pancho. That was uh, the name of her, her husband. In, 19, in 1884, they dated like for nine years, and then eventually, since she was uh, 14, and then she married nine years later. They had nine children, and amid so much suffering, Conchita stayed close to Christ and found life and joy. This would become the enduring message she had left for the church. And her children, I met three of her children, Francisco Pancho, the oldest, Ignacio, Nacho, and Guadalupe, Lupita. Um, and uh, all of them, when, when the process uh, for her to become blessed, from Rome they sent investigators and, and people in charge of, of, of doing the, her history and, and assessing the whole thing, her life. They, the children know what they said, you know, Mom was a very happy woman. She said, I don't know if she prayed a lot, but she was the best mom. She was a happy mother. Um, so she is um, she's an example of marriage and family well lived. As a matter of fact, uh, now when um, when the mass of beatification took place was in the Basilica of Our Lady Guadalupe in Mexico City, and Rome gave in three words a summary of her life. She was a lay person, a mystic. and an apostle. Those were the three words that summarize who she was. And, um, and it's true, and what I know of her, and, and as I said, is one of the persons that really I know the most from inside out. Um, she wrote of her husband, Pancho, quote, Never did my love for him, so full of tenderness, hinder me from loving God. I love him with a great simplicity, as wholly enveloped in my love for Jesus. I, don't, I didn't see there was any other pathway for me to come to God. And of course, that means marriage. So she loved her husband and children with all her heart, but found that she drew closer and closer to the Lord through her love of the family. Still, Conchita desired more. Her burning love of God brought her deeper and deeper into mystical experiences, visions and experiences in her soul. When she was 27 year old, years old, Conchita went to her first retreat. This picture, you like how many retreats you have done? How many ads retreats? And these retreats, and all kinds of retreats. Her first retreat was when she was 27 years old, and she got all raised some children. And Conchita heard in her, in her heart, in her soul for the first minute, uh, time, the voice of the Lord Jesus. The Lord had chosen her to hear his voice and share with the church the message of the love and power of the cross. That was the message. The spirituality that she's known for is called the spirituality of the cross. You know, this, in knowing a little bit about this particular blessing, saint, uh, it's just to connect you with many saints of your devotion, of the saints that you hear sometimes we celebrate in the church. But this is maybe someone closer. You know, 
you know, some friends of Assisi, well, 1300s, uh, St. Augustine in the 300s, you know, uh, the apostles, right, the time of Christ, um, the beginning of the church. But she is really closer to us. Um, Conchita was chosen to show how persecution, pain, and suffering cannot stop the love of the Lord. Cannot destroy true life. And the symbol of the cross, I mean, the symbol of the spirituality, is a cross that some of you, any of you have the cross of the apostle? You have it here, right? Yeah. It's a small one, has, um, you have seen it maybe at, at the cathedral, at the cathedral, uh, you like to come here, so at least that we know that I'm not lying, that I'm not making it up, but it's true. So, it's the cross with the heart and the Holy Spirit. So it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it's, that is our personal cross, or the crosses of other people. You know, some people, they say, oh, you know, my life has been very easy. And, you know, I really don't know too much about suffering. But maybe you know someone who suffers. And sooner or later, it's part of the human experience to struggle, to suffer, to, to be restless, to, um, to, to be challenged, to be sometimes by injustices, to be, to be oppressed, um, or to be left out to the crowd, whatever the case may be. So, um, for her, on the contrary, we come to true life through the cross. True life is the quality of somebody living life, not the ones that, you know, by a sunset, this picture, Cancun, where I art, Hawaii by the ocean, seeing the sunset, and drinking a beer. <laughs> but with that, I cannot prove you who I am. We prove the quality of a person and how the person endures and deals with difficulties, with problems, with personal crosses or the crosses of other people. Is when you see, you know, the the quality of a person. And especially in the way to holiness, someone who follows Christ. So, but still, give me a beer anytime, okay? <laughs> that was good. Okay. The mission laid before her was not a small one. The Lord commanded her, saying, Your mission will be to save souls. That is what she heard in the first retreat. Just that phrase. And she thought that then the task was to help her husband and children and people who were helping her in the house. She didn't have, the, at that point, the larger picture. She thought that was my vocation. That's my, yeah. um, but then, especially later on, uh, she understood that especially uh, priests and people, lay people, priests, lay people, religious, and consecrated life, men, men and women, who, if they are living the Christian life, are supposed to be the leaders of that, and their failures, their sins. And we have heard about that clearly. We are in a better situation now, but how, how painful it has been for the church and for society. When we hear about all those cases that took place uh, decades back. So your mission will be to save souls. She was called to sanctify the world and to share the good news of the cross. She was also to call, called to live the mystery of the cross deeply in her own life. So not only as a, not a message, this is the message of the gospel, Jesus on the cross, and that's why in the, in the Catholic Church, in another, another 
Christian groups, they have the cross. But usually what we, we have a cross is with Jesus on it, with Jesus Christ. So uh, she began intense penitential and ascetical practices. She also began to write down the words that the Lord shared with her and her own words related to the mission he had given her. You know, the, uh, today, I said, to, just to be more familiar with the topic, um, I, I read a little pamphlet of her. And she, she, uh, she wrote 200 volumes. And they put together all her writings, these 200 volumes. And she's considered one of the most prof prolific uh, members of the Catholic Church in history. She wrote a lot, and she never had formal education. She was taught in the house, and then a couple of uh, ladies were helping her. Uh, uh, she became a mystic, a great writer on reverse topics. The Trinity, the Father and the Son, the Way of the Cross, and Joseph, the Blessed Mother, um, uh, the Church. Um, and I have just her diary is um, is 60, 66 books, 66. And I, I was able to read the whole life at least two times. But I have read what I am aware of, all her writings. So that's why I said earlier, it's a person in my life that I know pretty well, pretty well. Um, as her mission continued, this truly remarkable disciple came to understand that she was to build a greater work. That is not the writings, it's not just to live a, uh, well and, and form well her family, but remember also her husband. She's, she speaks beautifully about her husband. And, and she said, you know, from the very first time that I met him, I always, always let, let him die. And you can see in, in, her, in what she, she wrote her diary, that was, I am going to prepare a meal, and then afterwards, it's a great experience of God or Jesus. Or, uh, she was dealing with her daily life as a mother and as a wife, but all the pages you, uh, that I have read, and I, I think I have read all her writings, they need to die. Isn't that something? I mean, because sometimes you'll say, well, I mean, why every page? Why every day? Well, that's the way to holiness. Um, so towards the end of the 19th century, Conchita began founding the many members of the family of the cross. She is the inspirator of the source of 18 different groups. So the, there's one order of men that I belong to, the missionaries of the Holy Spirit. But there were also orders for women, for laity, for people, uh, lay people with promises. Well, all this variety. And all to emphasize the spirituality of the cross that has at the center the prison of Jesus that all of us we share. Otherwise, you will not be called to holiness. Only the sisters, the Salishan sisters in the back back there, <laughs> only me, missionary of the Holy Spirit, Father Jonathan, no! Every baptized shares in the prison of Christ. Not ministerial prison, Father Jonathan and I, but the prison of Christ. Now remember, she is like, she died 40 years or so uh, before Vatican II, but that came to the highlight of Vatican II. The priesthood of the laity, that everyone, that there is no first class, second class. The Pope and all of us, what we have in common is that we are baptized. 
And with baptism began the, the process of holiness. And then the liturgy, proper of life. But the process of holiness began in baptism for all of us. Then these different apostolates has been sent to the church and the world to share the good news of the cross and the mercy of God. In her life, Conchita became, well, I already say a lot of different works, and um, we have here with us in the Archdiocese, the Apostleship of the Cross, and there are some members here, um, the Doris of the Holy Spirit, maybe you had met Sister Ana Cecilia, Somebody has met Sister Anna Cecilia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She's trouble. You know. <laughs> <laughs> she was baptized, don't you know? Wait to all this. <laughs> Conchita's work continues to give light to the church and these communities, and we give thanks to God for her tireless efforts and her spirit. However, my friends, I would like to leave you today with a deeper appreciation of the spirituality of the cross. I will mention something. All the saints, when the work is finished, you can tell they were, I mean, in some way, they were ordinary people, they were born, they were, they were, they, their life began in the womb, sure. And they were born to this world that we see and we share. No matter it was the apostles all the way to the present. But always there, is, there are some things that the saints that would be like too much for us. You can think about Teresa Calcutta. <laughs> to just walk on the streets and actually she picking up people from the floor and with her sisters to find a way for that person that was almost dying, neglected, to die no more no less. Well, we are so protected. <coughs> don't touch this. Don't look that way. Don't do this. Don't do that. Loss and loss and loss and loss. Like we are really lost. And maybe we are sometimes. But not always. So each saint, sometimes I'm a sissy, the stigmata, so I say, oh my goodness. It's something kind of strange. Well, Conchita did, it, did uh, some strange things. For example, she used to walk in Mexico City, that is, today has 25, 22 million people. It's from Mexico City. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want, uh, and, uh, and she used to walk on the streets in poor neighborhoods. And when she saw women with their babies on the floor, on the sidewalks, and she would offer to give them, to nurse them. Sure. Saints are ordinary people, but also God works to them extraordinary things because it's the power of God. The power of God, the God is in little things and in very uh, striking things too. But well, the spirituality of the cross contemplates, lives and transmits Christ in his aspect of priest and, and victim a priest, and we don't want to use victim, as the one who offered himself, you know. When I celebrate the Mass, I offer the bread and the wine. And the idea is that I offer myself with the Lord. That is the Lord. Well, in the case of Jesus on the cross, he offered, he was a priest, but also he was offering himself. That's the victim, priest and victim. And it's expressed in the following formula. Formula: By divine will, we have been called to participate through baptism in the common priesthood of the faithful, following Christ, priest and victim. In his sacrifice for love and of love and through love, emphasizing his fidelity to the Father and his salvific solidarity with his brothers and sisters. In other words, we, as followers of Christ, we cannot say, well, I am okay, and people are dying. Or today, on the news, was an earthquake in, in Indonesia. We can say, oh, things would rather happen there. What? We 
We are called to be in unity, in communion with others. And though maybe we can never experience right here an earthquake, we can relate through other sufferings to their, to their suffering. And when somebody comes to us and we have the opportunity, a person that is suffering, we can bring consolation, understanding, care, attention, unity, even sometimes just be there listening. So with Mary, we offer Jesus, and we offer ourselves with him to the Father, above all in the Eucharist. And that is one of the reasons why the Eucharist is the center of our Catholic faith. It's, it's not a rosary. The rosary is a very good devotion in the Catholic Church. But the key experience for Catholics is the celebration of the Eucharist. And from there, everything goes there. All our prayers, novenas, uh, our reading with the scripture, but also to read with the Mass. That is the Eucharist. That is the Eucharist. That by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus comes to us again and again and again. He wants to be with us. And then to extend the reign of the Holy Spirit, the salvation of people, the sanctification of the church, and, and especially priests. What a great time. We want to live our Catholic faith. What a great time to do it with the crisis that for decades our church has experienced. To emerge as hope, as life, as care, as understanding, and to help the church to be what we are called to be in its members, the body of Christ. So um, in short, the spirituality centers on our baptismal union with Christ, the high priest. His sacrifice is unlike all priests before him. Jesus offered himself for the salvation of the world. So we are called, as we have heard in several Gospels, the Synoptics, and also in different ways in St. John, St. John's Gospel, we are called to carry our cross daily. You're, you're a follower of Christ? Carry your cross daily, daily. Any suffering, any slight, any pain, any struggle, any challenge is an opportunity to exercise our priesthood. You know, maybe some of you will remember, but for sure in my generation, um, because I don't, I don't think there is anyone older than me here in this room. <laughs> I accept it. <laughs> and peacefully, <laughs> and joyfully. But uh, we used to be invited to offer up everything, everything, the joys, the pains. In other words, it's not just mine, it's the Lord. When I join with him, it's the Lord. It has the merits, the, the virtue, the virtue of God, the God made man, Jesus Christ. So, um, and that is a possibility for new life. You know, when we speak about new life, it's not but through the cross. And he spoke, you know, for example, talking about beer, I just connected with Alcoholic Anonymous. <laughs> but what they do there is that painful experience, or those difficulties of that individual, or individuals who are in that process, is to help them through the same uh, um, struggles that they have to come through and to be able or to stop drinking or to drink with moderation and to be more assertive. But what a wonderful thing, new life comes. Instead of saying, oh no, no, you don't have a problem. You don't have a problem. How many parents? And here we have a couple of young uh, parents and one baby's here, but then you have two babies and it could be more. Uh, but uh, don't deprive your children of a struggling with life that then is when the true problematic issues emerge. If they know how to deal, to, to know when they are wrong, to say you are wrong. Now the way you say it, and the way, according to the age and personality. But otherwise, it's not to, 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 to give a favor to them, to think that, oh, we cover up for our children. I remember 
uh, in, uh, that happened to me in, in Chicago. And there was a problem with uh, a child in one of the schools. And they were very angry. And they were making a lot of noise in the school. And they wanted to talk to me. So I sent them to the, to the principal. But eventually, I went. And the parents, they couldn't accept that their child did something wrong. Why? Not only to avoid, according to them, for the child to feel bad, but it's, well, it was because their pride. Because if the child did something wrong, it's their child. And they were not going to accept that they, they were not forming their child in the right way. So the cross, looking from the perspective of, of God, no matter which cross that is, Sometimes there are no heavy crosses. I will tell you, just a few months ago, I went for someone to take care of my feet because one of my little ones was hurting and I thought it was the worst thing in the world. <laughs> I'm sure you can experience that. <laughs> you know, but anything, anything. And I rejoice too, and sometimes we are so happy, but. We don't connect that happiness with God. Everything could be offered. It makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. And also that we become better people to others. You know, understanding in relationships, you know, um, less demanding. And, and we build community and unity. As there are people that constantly are putting people against one another. Also, I have met people that they bring people together. And like St. Paul says, encourage one another. Build up each other. Wow. Well, uh, in other words, no true love is without sacrifice. It's only, she was say, oh, this is a text from her. Uh, the world is buried in sensuality. No longer is sacrifice loved, and no longer is its sweetness known. I wish the cross to reign. Today it is presented to the world with my heart, Jesus told her, so that it may bring souls to make sacrifices. No true love is without sacrifice. It is only my crucified heart that the ineffable sweetness of my heart can be tasted. Seen from the outside, the cross is bitter and harsh. But as soon as it's tasted, penetrating and savoring it, there is no greater pleasure. Therein is the repose of the souls. The soul inebriated by love. Therein is the light, is life. So it's not the psychological defect of masochism or, or sadism. It's when he's out of freedom like Jesus. And here you are many, many well, you are young to start with. And then I'm sure that you fall in love more than once. And you try to prove the love to the other person, or the other person challenges you, and, and, and that helps your opportunity for growth, for, for expanding, for connecting in a stronger ways. In what ways can you turn back to the cross today? We, in our own ways, no suffering, pain, rejection, alienation, and isolation. And we know the cross when it comes to us. So listen to the Lord. Hear the wisdom of Blessed Conchita. Embrace those crosses. This is not some twisted love of pain. Christians are not crazies. Well, some. <laughs> some. Um, it is the truest strength to trust the Lord and take on our crosses as priestly sacrifices for the salvation of souls. We always stand against injustice in the lives of our brothers and sisters. And to do that is to be ready to carry the cross. But in our own lives, we bear these wounds with faith in the one priesthood of the Lord who saves us. We cry out with the family of the cross, Jesus, Savior of all people, save them. This is one phrase. Conchita, 
for nine years, she wanted. When, when she knew that there were sisters, they, they weren't real people, they were in the convent. She was already married. So she told Jesus, Jesus, I want to belong to you. And, but I cannot be in the real life. I have my husband and children. So she, in the process of her spiritual direction for nine years, she asked, or she went, uh, she was every summer going to his brother's ranch for a few, few weeks or even a couple of months of vacation. And she saw how they were branding, branding uh, the cattle with the initials of his brother, the owner. So she said, you know, I'd like to be branded, at least in my body, with the initials of Jesus, to say that I belong to him. And so after nine years, the spiritual director gave, gave, gave her permission, and she put, you know, you have seen those H -A, um, J H S, and she <coughs> ran her chest with that. And then the cross of the apostle on top. And she said, now, at least, at least physically, I wish that all who I am, who I have, belong to him, but if I cannot do it as, at that time, they thought that only priests and nuns, they could they become holy and saints. So she said, at least I can belong to Jesus. And the phrase that she said was, Jesus, Savior of all people, save them. She said, I, later on she expressed clearly, I, I couldn't think about me or my children. It's just save them, save them, save them, save them. To be united with Christ in his intention of saving the world. So, my friends, I hope you take some time and learn more about the life of this blessed Conchita Cabrera de Arlina. She's a master of listening to the Lord and heeding His will. In her life, she experienced marriage and family and was present to priesthood and religious life in a special way. She's a friend, she's a very good friend in discernment of your vocation. She had to discern her vocation. She's friend in suffering and doubt. She's a saint with a message for our current, current age. May the spirituality of the cross also bless you and renew you. I urge you to bless the church and your own baptismal share in the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Do not deprive souls of the sacrifices that only you can offer for their good and salvation. Jesus is calling you, as he called her, in your own place and in your, your own circumstances. And Jesus calls to you saying, give me souls who love me in suffering. Not only when everything is okay, but in suffering. Who find their joy on the cross. My heart thirsts for such a love, an unselfish love an expiatory, crucified love. It is the only true love, the love which saves, purifies, and the love, Jesus said, I require through my commandments. So Jesus, Savior of all people, save them. Save them. It is when you think of faces, people, someone that you just saw on the street, you will never see that person again. But you can contribute to his or her salvation. And Blessed Conchita, pray for us. Thank you so much, Archbishop. Ooh. Do we have any questions? <clears throat> any questions? I have a question. Father Jonathan. So, uh, Francisco's nickname is Pancho. Ignacio's nickname is Nacho. What's the nickname for Gustavo? <laughs> 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 
chistoso. How do you say that in English? You know, my family, when I arrived, when my family came uh, many years ago, when I was not even a big priest, to California. And in the reception, many of my friends and, and classmates, they get to know them. And they heard how they were calling me. They were saying, Goose, this, Goose, that. And so many classmates, they were saying, Goose, Goose. <laughs> How they call me. <laughs> but no, this girl's okay. <laughs> Gustavo, Gustavo. Ay, yes. oh, simpatico. <laughs> Lord Bishop, I was blessed to be with you at the beatification of, uh, of Conchita at the Basilica of Our Lady Guadalupe. Can you talk a little bit more about? When she does embrace of the cross, she lost some of her children <coughs> tragically, which is so the parents' worst nightmare to li outlive some of their their children, and how that figured into her spirituality. Yeah, well, there were a few children. One of them uh, was drowned, you know, uh, and uh, the other two that were from, uh, because of illnesses. Uh, she had one son that became a priest. She wanted that son to become a missionary of the Holy Spirit. But she, he became a Jesuit. Oh! <laughs> that was painful too. <laughs> Whatever you wanted to do. Really. And then one of her daughters joined the order that she founded. She was never a religious. She never lived in the convent. And one of the communities that she founded, and her daughter joined, one of her daughters joined. But the key, and I'm glad you asked that question, because the key of the Holy Spirit Child of the Cross was her personal relationship with the Lord. Many people can pray for you, and you can be doing well, but you will. Nobody can have that relationship with Jesus and you. And so it was her relationship with the Lord. You know, uh, we visited a place during that trip where she learned how to pray even more deeply. So she was, she was in that garden that was very, it's very large. She was walking with Jesus. And, and Jesus said, she said, I want to pray. Teach me how to pray, Lord. The Lord said, invite me to pray with you. And she invited him to pray. And she says that Jesus started walking at her pace. But then, with time, she ended walking at his pace. The relationship with the Lord to walk with the Lord, to, to spend time with Him. And, and without that relationship, it's very difficult. And so she, with prayer, and also sharing, I mean, you can see in her pages also, her suffering, like you will expect any mother. If, if your oldest one, you know, we pray that we're not until due time. But I mean, the little one that is going to be three years old and dies, that's how he will not be in suffering. But not that she was avoiding that suffering, but she was able with Jesus to deal with it. You know, sometimes we go with a psychologist, psychiatrist, and we might need that help along the way. But her relationship with Jesus Suffice. Not for everyone that would be the case. So that relationship and uniting everything with the Lord. But there were painful times. Painful times. Also when one of those little ones went down, she didn't have the finances. She was oh, I didn't mention that. She became a, a widow with the, with her children in an early time in her marriage. 
Her husband died uh, very young, and she was with them for 30 some years, 40 years uh, before she died. And, um, and she didn't have the money to bury her child. And so they put together just four pieces of wood and buried the son. Real struggle. Struggles is not to make up that the cross is beautiful. The cross in itself is not beautiful. But a cross with Jesus, with the crucified one, it changes very much. Any other question? We have a question on the yes. iPad. Yes. In her mystic experiences with Jesus, did Jesus give Conchita an urgent message for humanity to know? That, well, it is not, it's not a, a new word that is not in the Gospels. But as Jesus said, whoever wants to follow me, wants to be my disciple, really. That means the one who learns from me and, and is with me and follows me and walks with me, carrying your cross. And so the main, um, the spirituality of the cross, that's why it's the cross. Oh, but if you, you would say why the body, the corpse of Jesus, is now in the cross of the apostle. And the reason is because Jesus said, I have this, because that was the cross when I was in, uh, I was in, I mean, ordained as a, as a bishop. And, and the, the cross is the one inside the cathedral. Holy Name Cathedral in Chicago. But the Lord explained to her why not the cross. He said, and sometimes the crucifix itself, and maybe you have seen that in your own, in your own upbringing or as you will grow up. Sometimes some places they didn't have the, cross, the crucifix in their homes because it was like a scary thing. And you will have the crucifix only in the bedroom. I'm not in the living room. No way. I mean, said the point of me on the cross is because of my love, my heart, and my heart should attract people. When you see someone who married this lady, who married this man, and she said, "Why did, did she sewing him?" <laughs> <laughs> and she's mad about the love from him. Love. And you ask her, said, she says in front of everybody, my husband is so beautiful. <laughs> well, you know, but it's love. It's love. And so it's what he wanted to do to show his love. So he said, the heart, but the heart has the sign of the passion, it has the, the thorns and the lens. And you know the lens, like in the, in, in the passion of Christ, the lens, the sword. And the Lord explained to her, he said, it's not just the pain, but it's true, it cuts through. But it's that, through that opening, you can come in. Anyone can come. See, it's, it's a different way how to see it. Do you remember the first martyrs in Rome? They were there thrown in the lions and, 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 and they were singing. Not because that was a beautiful kind of action. It's because there is something else within. It's divine love. Yeah. Any other questions? Sure. Anything. Or maybe something of your own experience that, or, or something that you see other people going through. And so our society tells us to move away from the cross. Mm -hmm. how, do you, uh, how do you move beyond that into loving the cross and having a passion for the cross? You know, that is a church, and with all respect, but it's a church close to where I work in a, that says, Stop suffering. That's the name of the church. So who? I understand if it's psychological suffering and it's 
people who want to, to cause harm to themselves or to others, to stop that. But who of you can just because you say so, I will stop suffering, you will not suffer anymore in your life. There is no one person that I can met that is not suffering. So the way to do it is when we become compassionate, when we can understand, when we have walked this journey with Jesus, we can understand when somebody is suffering of emotionally, spiritually, physically, you are even drawn to, but not just to make the person feel good. It's because you understand. And that's a gift. That's why the union with God, with the Lord Jesus on the cross. Otherwise, but then we are disconnected. There are people that have told me sometimes, I don't have any suffering. And they say it in such a way that you know just in the way the person is saying it, that is suffering. And how do you know? Maybe two days later, two years later, five years later, the person lost a father or mother, or an illness comes, Suffering, it, rich, richness, in the sense of material richness, we cannot say that everyone in the world will have. It. But suffering, we can say that everybody, sooner or later, or in many ways, suffers. So the wealth that is there to be truly human and truly divine, I mean, it's a gift. It's, it's a gift. I mean, we don't want to, to have it. So we will struggle with our own suffering and the suffering and shortcomings of other people. But with divine love, we can utilize and channel all that for the glory of God and the salvation. Any other question? <laughs> you know, I should have run. Yes. Oh, yes. Stephanie. Wondering if you had to recommend one of her books to pray with, what's your favorite? Uh, you remember, all, all the saints, if you want to connect with the spirituality of John Bosco, is to understand if there are saints, they have a, the message of the gospel uh, all times, but you need to understand them in their own. When, the, when they were born in their own context. So you want to know St. Paul through the, his letters and understanding the time of Rome and all, you can understand him. So in the case of Panchita, the book will be Before the Altar. That is one book that expresses quite well the spirituality. But in that context that she lived, that was in the late 1800s and in the beginning of the 19th century. Um, another good book is called Diary of, uh, of a Mother, Mother of Family. That is very good, very good book. Her, it's, it's just one book, it's only 67 books, six volumes. I mean, books, it's just one book. But that is another one. Um, El, el Diario Espiritual de Conchita, that's one, one book, it's a, di a diary of a family. That is, of Father um, Philippon, he was French, a Dominican priest. Mm -hmm. We have another question. Yes. What is your... Do we have another beer? No, no. <laughs> Say is your role as Archbishop in San Antonio? My role in San Antonio, well, the role of any bishop is to be shepherd. And a priest is a shepherd in that parish. The bishop is for the archdiocese, which means 
oversees all the parishes and all the Catholic activity and apostolates. But there are many kinds, flavors, schools, hospitals, uh, places for the poor, for children, for, for uh, uh, women, in young age with children. Well, there are so many apostolates. But as a shepherd, my work is to build unity with the Lord, people of the Lord, and among ourselves. So that's my work. So I go to a parish, and whatever I said to the, in that parish, in that Sunday Mass, is to connect them with the rest of the archdiocese, that they are not isolated, and that the Catholic faith, building that unity, is, is known and, and lived. But it's unity, unity. I hope that in the archdiocese that is happening, and, and with the longing that nobody will be alone. That no one should be alone. No one. And though many people live with that sense, we want to, to be there, but to connect in some way, but to help somebody to connect with that person. So no one is alone. A lonely life is more difficult than sometimes we think. It has a lot of ramifications. Suffering, uh, loneliness. That's why our hope is that one day, in due time, when we die, that we will go to heaven, to be one with God forever. That, there is no scientific explanation about that. There is a rational understanding, but no scientific explanation. Um, but that we hope one day in other religions is again the unity with with that being in which everything is fulfilled. Not here on earth. No, there I will not have forty less of beer like that is. That is the fulfillment. No. So that union, that is, is love and is fullness. So why we will not do something for someone that, that is hurting, that is feeling alienated, alone? Yes? Yeah, did you have a mm. Thank you for asking. Yes. And, and she had in different ways as she was growing up. And there she has books on her, too. But, um, but especially, she was connected with Our Lady. Um, when Jesus left the, the ascension of Jesus, yeah, that begins that experience in some way at the foot of the cross. Jesus died. But then, the resurrection, so Jesus was around in some way, present to the community. But when he ascended into heaven, it's like when, I'm not saying you, but you are here as parents, and you have two children. You can imagine it was to let your child, you love your child and then, you you still feel in the body, but then when you bury the child, when really is the sense of that separation, she start to connect him with the Blessed Mother during those years since the ascension of Jesus, you know, until well, until we meet him again, and during that time, how to keep him loving forgiving, caring, you know, for the Blessed Mother and, and for her assumption, her final encounter with Jesus, with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That, that time was very difficult, but she was a mother of the church during that time, and it's still today. Yes. 
Is there any uh, known miracles through her intercession in, on her way to canonization? Yes. Well, one miracle that I will mention because having many different favors, miracles, but the one was approved for her beatification. It was never. It was a millennium, <laughs> no. uh, and it was a man who was already um, in hospice and treated by doctors for years, and still living. But so they were just waiting for him to die. Not the hospital. And the family was asked if they wanted to take him home. They said at that moment, "Well." We will make the decision in a few days. So this, this man was in the hospital. And one man, he start, this man was start talking. They thought it's hard to understand him. And maybe this man, I mean, because of medication, you know, for pain, maybe he's, he's losing it. But one member of the family recorded it. And he was talking with someone when I was in Chile. And as is, and you can see it on the on the internet. And he started recuperating. He was all all um, crippled. crippled, and also he, because he was for so long was damaging his, his internal organs. And he started. And he left the hospital walking, and he's fine. And I met him. He has uh, four children, if I recall correctly. Maybe his wife, too. So that was a miracle. But it was because of the, of the phone, the iPhone. And so, besides all the studies and the doctors, they have to give proofs and uh, all the inquiries. But also was... With modern technology, contemporary technology. <laughs> so, homes are good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you wanted a question. Yeah, I have a question, but I guess this is politics. I'm not sure if you want to take it. Okay. There is a, you know, the Republican Party is pro-life, but the Democrats seem to favor the immigrants. So I'm like undecided. What is, or what is our role here? Okay. With that could be a question that could be in people's minds. I will invite you to think about you and everybody. The thing that is not a party because in both or three parties or four parties, whatever the case whichever the case may be, there are people all over the spectrum. And we, in our Catholic uh, faith, we are, we respect life from the very beginning to natural death, the unborn and the born and all in between. How I will say to these parents, and I have been using you for the sake of understanding, this young couple, I remember with your two little ones that were in the womb. They were better when they were in the womb and more meaningful to you than when they were born. Or you can say the other way around. They were more meaningful then. Or always meaningful, always. We are pro-life all the way through, or we are not. So to say, someday think about immigrants, no. All of us, no matter in which party we place, we should be for immigrants. All of us, we have to be for babies in the womb. All of us, we have to be for the elderly. All of us, when we start splitting, that is called paranoia, that is called psychological illness that is called um, 
that you have multiple personalities. So if you are in one personality, you think this way about life. If you think this other personality, you think about that way. As Catholics, be in the, in the womb, like they say also to the tomb, but all in between. And the same carries to the baby in the womb as someone on the street. Or you. Otherwise, why I would care about you? You are a grown up. <laughs> care about yourself. Forget about, no. Everyone, otherwise, is a lie. And that's why all parties are deficient. All of them. All of them. For, for us Catholics, all of them are deficient. And then we have to do an analysis and to, and to figure out, and then in conscience, in conscience, to vote. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, before we go, or just shut down for the night, you don't have to leave. I have a few announcements for you. And so I think every one of you, when you came in, received a piece of paper, and it might say something like the assembly on it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes, okay, good. Who already registered? All right, all right, all right, awesome, awesome. So I wanna give you just a brief about what it is, because some people have asked, what is this, why are you handing me this? So. Um, you heard the Archbishop talk about the call to holiness and that we are all called to, I'm going to say it this way, make trouble for God, right? And so um, we are called also to accompany others through the walk of life, right? Every stage, every transition, whether you're new parents or new um, married couples or you are trying to figure out how to walk with others through transitions or something like that, the assembly is a gathering of the entire archdiocese where we will meet at St. Mary's and the Archbishop will celebrate Mass and then we'll have five topics. These topics are what you, the people of God, have told us, the Archdiocese, that you want us to provide for you. So on your paper, you have some topics on there. One's being companions in our journey of faith. One's accompanying our families. One's passing on the gift of faith. Another one I think that you all will like is one that's called Being Church in Today's Society. And so those speakers are going to be giving talks English and in Spanish. And especially for this talk, it's going to teach the people who attend how to walk with others, how to be Catholic more than one hour on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So if nothing else, select that one. So it's on November 9th. Um, if you have any questions, um, see me. You have your paper, go online, sign up online on assemblysa.org. You'll find videos on the speakers. You'll find more about the, the topic. So if you want to be more involved in your faith, then come to the assembly. That's why I hope y'all are here to be more involved, right? To learn more about what does the church say on specific topics. So thank you, thank you, thank you for coming tonight. But, you know, come come again. Come to something else. We're we are providing these things just for you. So... Um, moving on, in October, we're going to be here again at Smoke. October 24th will be our next session, and we will be with Councilwoman Anna Sandoval, 7 p.m. So um, come back next month. And just to let you know, we will not be meeting in November and December because those Thursdays are usually Thanksgiving and Christmas. So enjoy your family, your friends, and then join us back in January. But... This Advent, the Archdiocese of San Antonio and Father Sean Carey, a deaf priest from the Diocese of Boston, welcome you to open your hearts and become Christ Fit through a series of inspirational talks. The Christ Fit Inspired series will begin with a talk for young adults on Friday, December 6th, 
and whenever, uh, if you have some time, look at what's scrolling behind me because that information is on there. But the location is to be determined. So if you found us through either um, Facebook or the Meetup group, or if you are subscribed to the Archdiocese and emails, you'll get a reminder for that. But for more information, please contact Angela Maurer. She's the director for Deaf Ministry, so you don't want to miss that. And with that, we'll see you our Yes, uh, I will have for you, I, I forgot today, but I will send something for you, for each and every one of you, next time with, uh, with our staff, our brothers and sisters who help us in the office, and, um, and I will, you can count with my prayers. My main work, as somebody asked, what is my work as a bishop? So, is that unity, but is prayer, through prayer. So I will be praying for you, and for your needs, and, and for you. And uh, I will give you a blessing. You can be stand, a sitting, and I will say a prayer for you. May the Holy Spirit, source of all purity of heart, communicated to you through the cross. May the Spirit keep your body and your soul pure so that you can see God and may people find God through you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.